German text today will be found in uh, page Psalm 34, 1 through 10, and that is found on page 861 in the Pew Bible. Again, that's Psalm 34, verses 1 through 10, and it's found on page 861 in the Pew Bible. A Psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. So magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this ability, for this privilege, for this, just this wonderful uh, ability to come and gather together on your day with your saints. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that uh, your word gives us encouragement and hope. We thank you, Jesus, that, that uh, we have seen a great victory this week, Lord, uh, that you have given this country time to right itself, possibly. We thank you for that. And Lord, but we thank you for your word especially. We thank you for the hope it says that blessed is the man who trusts in you and to taste and see that you are good. Lord, we would pray that, that people who may not know that truth that their hearts would be changed and they would be able to see that you are indeed good in all things. Jesus, we pray even now as Pastor James comes to expound on your word that ears would hear and eyes would see and hearts that don't know you would come to a saving grace in Jesus' name. song and, and Blair you coming up with that this past week and bringing it to all of our attention. <clears throat> Who's ever working back there? The camera went out. There's nothing we must say. <laughs> it's fixed. Um, huh? It's fixed. Perfect. So honestly, I'm not an advocate that we put the American flag on our fault in our church by any respects. But I also believe that we ought to, in the church, not shy away from a desire that our nation might come to Christ. That we might be able to say what scripture says about nations. The nations are the Lord Jesus Christ. He sits at the right hand of the Father over all rule and authority, and now commands all men everywhere, gathered as we are, into nations to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. This past week, I wanted to look at, as we were looking forward to the elections, that we might have a Christian perspective about those elections. And really, what I'd like to do this week and next week 
And last week we looked at Psalm 34, which I think gave us a great perspective as we faced uncertainty in those elections. And trust me, we still face a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uh, concern over our nation. Uh, as I said last week, I think President Trump was a vast improvement upon whatever Kamala Harris would have had for us. And I think that was God's mercy. But there are nation, there are states that, that voted to try to secure the right of women to, to kill their babies in their own wombs. We're still a nation divided. We're still a nation with great challenges. But I truly believe, like Blair said this morning, that we can look to God and continue and begin to pray and to ask him to change all of that, to bring this nation to repentance, to bring this nation not to be some glorified political, you know, nominal Christians who gather and sing America the Beautiful and don't have any clue about the God who created this country, but that who are very self-consciously Christian. The only hope for any nation is that they might turn from their sins, come to Christ, and obey everything that God has in his word. That is still our hope. Our hope is not in presidents, it's not in kings, it's not in princes, although we pray that our presidents, our kings, and our princes would bow the knee to Christ. The Lord does not just work in individuals, but he works in families, he works in culture, and he works in nations to bring reformation, to bring revival, to bring change. We ought to expect that. I think for too long, the church has lost its way and abdicated its responsibility to preach from the pulpits that this nation might honor Christ, that Jesus might be Lord in every area of our uh, culture and nation. So last week I took a break, as I said, from Romans, and I want to continue. Uh, a Christian perspective on election, election day. Uh, again, this week, though, I want to continue, and I want to continue to look at what it, should our heart be? What should our orientation, what should our view, what should our perspective be as we move now post-election? What should we, as responsible Christians, be doing, be hoping for, be praying for, be trusting in. Uh, the psalmist made it very clear in Psalm 33, 1, for praise from the upright is beautiful. So no matter how dark things seem, our God loves righteousness and justice, and see, which in our culture now seems to be completely antithetical to that. Still now. I don't think we'll look at our nation and go, boy, we're really in line with God's justice, truth, and righteousness. But in the midst of that darkness, the psalmist encouraged us to be those that pray, that rejoice, and he'll do that again today. Today we know it's David. But we know, despite the darkness, despite, despite the trouble, that the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Despite those wicked in our nation, from the highest places, devising evil plans to bring this nation to all types of debauchery, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And the Lord Jesus Christ is even now ruling and reigning. He makes the plans of the peoples of non effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. That's a promise. That's not just pie in the sky hope. But that's the truth. It doesn't matter what wicked men and women devise. He brings their counsels to naught. It is the Lord's counsel that stands forever. So again, this purely Christian perspective is something that we can hope for, that we can count on because it's promised in Scripture. Our hope is in Christ and his word. Yes. So I argue that we should pray for our nation to be truly Christian. More Christian than it ever has been. As I said last week, that we might be able to look back at the founding and say, those folks were heathens. <laughs> In comparison to a nation filled with 
folks that love God and love his word. That's what the Great Commission is all about. That's what the promise is. This purely Christian perspective, again, is something founded upon Christ, his res resurrection, his power, his rule, his authority. Psalm 33, 12 said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Cursed is every nation whose God is not the Lord of heaven and earth. Not the creator, not the triune God of the Bible, not the Lord Jesus Christ. Every nation who has any other God is cursed. So is it wrong for me to say I want our nation to be sincerely committed to Christianity? Is it wrong for me to say that I hope our president might bow the knee to Christ, that we can pray that? Is it wrong that our civil authorities shouldn't be honoring their call as servants of the living God? Of course it isn't. We don't need to be quiet about that. Listen, it's not unloving for me to say that folks that are from another religious persuasion should not be in authority. We want Christ to be king and lord. Does that mean this nation that has, has been a hodgepodge of people from all over the world, that I wouldn't want them to come? I want them all to come, but I want them to come in such a way that they join themselves to our nation and declare Jesus is Lord. Amen? Every nation is his inheritance, including the United States of America. Psalm 33 ends with a declaration that we will pray to the Lord. We will wait alone on him because he alone is our help, our shield, our buckler. He truly holds sway in the affairs of men. So we can with confidence trust in his name. My whole concern before election day was that we would be looking at streets that were filled with pandemonium and, and looting and, and destruction. God was merciful to us that this election was so resoundingly in favor of President Trump. He was kind to us that he didn't only win the Electoral College, but he went won the popular vote. They have nothing to say. I watched Kamala Harris's uh, concession speech. Any one of us could say yes and amen to that concession speech. She humbly called President Trump, congratulated him, and said she believes in the the peaceful transfer of power. What? These Democrats? <laughs> that tore our country up in 2020? God is good. Yes, he is. Even Joe Biden said that. That, that we, we turned the reins over to President Trump. God is sovereign, not men, not women. Yeah. And we have to be thankful because that was a mercy. I told Michelle, but I told you all, and I prayed last week, I prayed really thinking we're going to need to hang on to this because get ready. It's going to get crazy. I told Michelle the night before, I said, there's no doubt they're going to try to steal this thing, and we might not know for, for weeks. And I woke up the next morning, and there was a president. That's crazy. It's not, though. God is good. Yes, God, it is. God is Very merciful. Wonderful. That's right. And if he can do anything, it's his people who have to pray and ask him. He's willing and ready and able, and it's his perspective. It's his plans. It's his uh, decrees that shall come to pass. So we are those that, that, at the end of that psalm, are those that are called to rest and to trust in the Lord God. And we prayed at the end of last week, let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. May God bless America, and he has. So this week, I'd like to continue this three-part series. I would like us to further consider a Christian perspective of hope for the good life post-election. A proper relationship with the living God is the source and promise of the good life post-election. It was the same pre-election. Good life. Is it okay to pray for prosperity? Is it okay to pray that our country might be righteous and and in right relationship with God so that he might bless us? Is that wrong? 
There are so many Christians that think you're really blessed when you're under the gun. When, you're, when the boot is on your neck, well, then you're really blessed. The problem is, we've been blessed in the past, and what happens is we get soft and lazy. We don't appreciate God or his great gifts. But if he's good to return to us a nation where we can live in peace, raise our children according to his ways, let's not ever take it for granted. Let's recognize that it's God that is the giver of all these good things. Mm -hmm. That's my prayer for every nation, including our nation. Mm -hmm. It's okay to pray for the nations. We're looking in Romans, and the whole point of what Christ did was so that the whole world <laughs> would be blessed, so that all the nations would come to him, all the Gentile nations, that there's not just one blessed nation, Israel, but now the Israel of God is spread out between Jew and Gentile, arranged in every nation. You know what they call those folks? Christians. <laughs> Christians. So again, I want to consider a perspective of hope for the good life. And I want to tell you it's not wrong that we pray in hope for the good life. Right in the center of this psalm that we're going to look at, David says this who, in verse 12. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may say, see good? Who is the man? Who is the woman who desires life and loves many days that they may say good? Raise your hand if you're up for that. Come on. Right? Right? That was a rhetorical question. Everybody wants that to a person. We ought to want it, fight for it, pray for it, so we can raise our kids in freedom. This nation was founded on freedom. You know where freedom comes from? It comes from God. Whom the Lord Jesus Christ sets free is free indeed. Amen. What are we free for? To be slaves of God. We are free to be servants of the Most High God. We are free to live according to his will and his ways. And if we do, we will be blessed. So I say that's a rhetorical question that we all might ought to be praying for. This is the very concept that our forefathers enshrined in the Declaration of Independence, rightly attributing this as rights that come down from the Creator, that is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This seems again to be King David's proposition in this psalm. So he asks again at that center, who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? So again, appropriately, just, just as a matter of fact, to let you know where we're going here, Charles Haddon Spurgeon looked at this hymn, and he broke it up into two sections. Verses 1 through 10, he sees as a hymn, and, and uh, 11 and following as a sermon. So this week, I really want to look at these first 10 verses and see them as a Christian view of how we ought to live post-election. I don't think it's wrong to look at it in that manner. And then next week, in the, the sermon part of this hymn, we will get more particular about how we need to apply what we live by in verses 1 through 10. So Blair read that for you. And so keep a copy of God's Word open on your laps. I'm going to work my way through verses 1 through 10. And I want to see proper focus, proper protection, and proper vision. So again, there is no doubt, folks, that we live during a dark time, but we're hoping and praying for brighter times in which our nation will truly once again be one nation. And maybe they weren't ever where they needed to be, but that we might be one nation under God. That we might be the truly blessed nations, nation whose God is the Lord. Even though, as I said a little bit earlier there, as we look at this election, there is much to be hopeful about. There, there's much to be op cautiously optimistic, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Some good stuff. Listen, the streets are not in mayhem right now. Right. There's much to be thankful for. Right. But we have to realize we still live during a very troubling, deep, dark, divided time in our nation. 
But in this time, just as the last psalmist told us, we need to be those who are uncompromisingly having a focus that is properly placed upon the living God. A focus and a desire to worship him rightly. Our desire, again, is to have a good, biblically ordered civil government so that we can live freely. But we have to recognize that in this time, there's still struggle. I don't think all the bad times are behind us. But good times, bad times, we worship God. No matter what. No matter what. But if this morning it was the exact opposite as we had hoped for, we could still worship God. There are so many on the left who believe their lives have ended. They have no hope. These folks are troubled. You know why? They don't have their hope placed in the right place. Their focus is completely out of line. If things had gone badly, we could have woke up, told our children, told ourselves, God is still God. He is still to be worshipped, no matter what. And that's pretty much what the psalmist says here. Verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Our focus is the Lord. Yes, we need to recognize it's he who answers our prayers, and it's he who fights on our behalf. In this time, we need to be those who rejoice in the Lord, who continually bless, praise, give thanks to him. Look what it says there. At all times, continually, we will bless the Lord, we will praise the Lord. Do you bless the Lord always, continually? It's easy to praise and bless the Lord when things seem to be going well. And listen, this is a national context I want to bring forward, but it's an individual context, too. You see that. Maybe this morning, even though President Trump was elected, you are in difficult, tough times. You still should be one who continually worships God, who continually praises and gives thanks to God. It's truly those who recognize our frailty our condition as man who fully appreciates the great goodness of God in the midst of trouble. Am I not right? Mm -hmm. We trust in God, we boast in him, not in our own strength. That's what the psalmist said last week. We must never depend strength, but on God alone. Humility is important. If you're not at that place and you're a Christian, he'll bring you to that place. Mm -hmm. He will bring you to a place of humility. I'm so thankful for the for, for, the, for my frailty, for my uh, weakness, because it made me the type of person who needs a God who's great and strong. I'm not ashamed to say Resist the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 2, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. This is our story. This is our song. Praising our Savior all the day long. We must have God-centered lives as Christians. We must have God-centered lives as Christians. You know how someone's life is God-centered? It just flows out of them. Praise and worship to God just is it just comes out of them naturally. Again, I'm elated that President Trump won. But when people look at me, they don't first come up and go, Oh, you're a Trump supporter, aren't you? No. They come up and go, You're a Christian. You love Christ, don't you? okay that I support Trump. I made that really clear. <laughs> okay? And there's nothing wrong with being politically vibrant and, and vote for what's right. But at the end of the day, I'm not a Republican. I'm a Christian. 
And I pray at the end of the day, this isn't just a nation, but it's a Christian nation. And that's a good thing. My focus, my, my whole life is centered around God and not myself. My whole life is centered around devotion alone and focus upon God. So the psalmist David says this, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. The primary purpose in our good life that we desire to live is to glorify God. What does the good life look like? It looks like someone who has been delivered from hell who has been delivered from the power of his sins and her sins so that we might be able to truly rejoice and magnify God. So often the magnifying glass is on us. So often we're the star of our own story, aren't we? God has to be the star of our story. We must magnify him. We must do everything to make him be magnified and bigger in our lives. You've got to be like one of those telescopes that can see into other galaxies. <laughs> How big we make and see God. We so often rejoice and, 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 and love the things that are wrong. We so often are thankful to God for the wrong things. Sometimes we're thankful to God for what he gives us. If he gives us a good nation again, praise God. But I'm not going to worship this good nation. I'm going to worship the God who gave us peace. I'm going to worship the Lord Jesus who sits at the right hand and that justice and peace is going to grow. And it's his kingdom that will fill the earth with people that magnify God. And you see there, it's the, C, uh, the Christian Standard Bible puts it this way, proclaim the Lord's greatness. This is meant, again, to be done as we see here. I think it's meant to be done as individuals, as families, as in culture, in this nation, in communities. May that grow, right? But the most wonderful time we do it together is every Lord's Day. We get together, together. Look at what it says there. Look at the corporate nation of it. The corporate nature of it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Weep with those that weep. We're called into a corporate body. We're called together. We're not supposed to be solitary or walking this out alone, and we're not supposed to be those who worship God alone. But I don't think it's wrong to sing that song we sang and to pray that we might, as a nation, be able to do that. That there used to be a time when there was a church on every street where every family was catechizing their children, which I hope, hope you will do. They weren't perfect, but God was our God by and far. So we can sing like we did this morning, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Is that wrong? Do I not, do I need to, can I love God and love my nation? Yes. Of course we can. But so often in the church, they make you feel like you can't. So this worship, again, is wonderful. It's something that we enjoy individually, as families, corporately, on Sunday. But I pray one day we might be able to enjoy it as a nation. You know, we ought to be those that love our nation and, and love, love our fellow man. Do good to all men, especially those who are of the church, right? Those who are Christians. But we're also called as Christians to love our enemies, to do good to those that despitefully use us. We should be the best citizens in America because we won't just love our Christian neighbor, but we're going to love our neighbor that's so hurting these days. Our neighbor that feels like their lives have, have been swept out underneath them. We need to come and tell them it's okay that your daughters one day, God willing, won't have abortions. 
You shouldn't feel bad about that. Your life is not in shambles because your daughter won't have the right, which she still does sadly in this country, to kill your grandchildren. We need to be able to come with the gospel and tell them, wake up, Christ is Lord. And then we can teach them that God created the family. And it's a good thing. Proper protection. This here in the second part, verses 4 through 7, is really David's testimony. We have to recognize the occasion of this psalm. David wrote this during a very deep and dark time in his life. He was on the run from King Saul, who was bringing all the force of Israel down on his head, trying to kill him. It wasn't enough that he was on the run, but he was alerted to the fact that Saul wanted to kill him from his very best friend, Jonathan. They wept and they parted because he told them, my father wants to kill you. David was on the run. He was by himself at this point. He couldn't have been in a deeper, darker situation. David was alone and nearly starving. He came to the priest Ahimelech, who gave him food, holy bread, from the altar, because it's the only bread he had. That's how low David was. He didn't even have food, let alone he was on the run for his life. At that point, Ahimelech gives him Goliath's sword, <laughs> who he took when he chopped his head off, right? He didn't even have protection. He had no soldiers around him. He had no one with him. The king of Israel on the run for his life, and he had to take that sword, so at least he had something to protect himself with. So where does he run? He actually runs to Gath, which is the home, the former home of Goliath. <laughs> this is where David runs to, trying to run for his life. And he is so afraid of, of, uh, uh, afraid that he was going to be killed by Achish the king, that when he was brought before the king, he had to reduce himself to acting like a crazy man. He had to pretend he was full out of his mind. This is King David, anointed by Samuel to be the greatest king after God's own heart of Israel. Things didn't look so good right then. Things looked very bad right then. David, I'm sure, was doubting, questioning, struggling. He knew Saul wasn't going to kill him if he lived by faith, but he was questioning. He was on the run. It says in 1 Samuel 21, 13, that David scratched on the doors of the gate and let his saliva fall down on his beard. He was a straight up mess. Ever been there? Ever struggled? Ever felt like the whole world was against you? I can remember crying my eyes out till my nose was running and there was saliva coming down. But he had to make this up because he was afraid for his life. But the wonderful thing about this story is that King Achish says, I've got enough madmen, I don't need another one. Get rid of David instead of killing David. Even in the midst of when we struggle with our faith, God is faithful. Even David at this low point, God was faithful. Even in the midst of whatever situation we're in, as a nation, as families, as a church, as states, God is in control. And he watches out for us. David ends up running to the cave of Adullam, where in that cave, by himself, in the darkest place, and really he and his wife is in the darkest place figuratively and literally, but David was safe in that cave, and he wrote this psalm. And it wasn't much later that all of his mighty men came to his assistance. But this is, this is the context within, within which this psalm was written. Really, this is David's testimony. But I think it's something that we ought to be able to learn from. Despite whatever situation we're in, we're protected. We're kept by God. He keeps us, no matter how bad things seem. 
And looking at it as a national perspective, but you have to look at it as an individual perspective. I, as a pastor, am privy to everybody's struggles, sadly. Happily. I don't know which it is. <laughs> but I can tell you, God is faithful. He will protect you. He will deliver you out of whatever condition you're in and bring you out. Psalm 34, 4, David says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. David solely sought help from the Lord. Where does our help come from? It comes from the Lord. You're in trouble. We're in trouble. We must seek the Lord. And he says, he heard me and delivered me. You don't need to live in fear. You don't need to live in fear. One of the hardest things for Christians and everybody is to escape uncertainty. That births fear in our hearts. Am I going to be able to make it? Or am I going to be able to provide for my family? My wife's a knucklehead. Am I going to be able to get along with her? God is able. He's able to keep us and deliver us. We don't have to live in fear. He delivered David from a couple of his fears. From, from at least Achish, a couple, couple of them. No, from all of his fears. And he is the same today, and he will deliver you from all of your fears. Do you believe that? There's a condition to be delivered from fear called faith. The absence of faith is fear. But the cool thing is, your faith is not empty. It doesn't, it's not something that you have to work up. Faith is strong because of what it places its faith and trust in. That's right. Because it's in God who is all powerful. Not just all powerful, but watches and keeps us. David lifted his gaze from his situation to the God alone who delivers. In his darkest hour, he found great light. He and we can find radiant light that will shine on us now in this country, and in our circumstances. They looked, it says in verses 5 and 6, they looked at him and were radiant. The King James says, light it, lightened. And their faces were not ashamed. David declares, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Our God is a God who delivers out of all of our fears and all of our troubles. It's going to take a condition of heart. It's going to take humility. Sometimes these terrible conditions are to bring us to the end of ourselves so that we might truly recognize who we love and who we trust and who alone will deliver us. David had nobody. He might have been all puffed up. I'm going to be the king of Israel. Young dude, beat up the lion, beat up the bear. He was going to just conquer the world. Probably needed a little bit of pride to be kicked out of him. So he would be useful in the Lord's hands. Who is the man? who desires life and loves many days that he might see good, it's the humble man or woman who knows that God alone is our help. Psalm 4, 6 says this, There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Have mercy on us, Lord, and deliver us. God has to be our focus. It says there one of the most interesting little texts in, in Psalm 34, 7. And this idea of the commander of the Lord's hosts first appeared in Joshua. And I believe it's a Christophany. A Christophany is an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ before he became incarnate. There's always been God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I think when those three 
Hebrew youth were in the fire, and there was a fourth, I think that was the Lord Jesus Christ. I think when Abraham got a visitor at the tent, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe when Moses saw the glory of God and he spoke to him as a man speaks to another man, I think he was speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think this angel in our version says, little a, I think it's rightly capital A. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The Lord Jesus Christ, again, is this commander of the armies of the Lord, the host. He encamps around us. The Lord Jesus is all around us. We're filled with his Holy Spirit. He's always with us in the darkest, deepest pits that we fall into. He's ever with us, no? Right. Is that not what he promised us? He what are we so upset about all the time? Jesus is with us. He encamps around us. He has us hemmed in on all sides. So even when we struggle, he's there to keep us. I love the Great Commission. But look at how wonderfully it ends. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I remember him telling his disciples, it's better that I go away. Because if I go away, if I don't go away, you don't get the comforter. I can imagine them saying, Lord, don't go away. <laughs> we need to have you here with us. But he made a way now that Jesus comes to all of us. And he encamps around all of those that believe. It, it really reminds me of that story in 2 Kings when there's the servant of Elisha who was just quaking in his boots a scare, afraid of his own shadow, and it says this, Alas, my master, 2 Kings 6.15, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, all around Elisha. He was encircled by God's presence. Hallelujah. And all those angels. Folks, we're going to win this battle because of the Lord. That's right. The battle is the Lord's. And he will bring it forth. We and the Lord make a vast majority. I remember there's that uh, uh, a joke I probably told you before where there's this mouse and this elephant that were buddies. And they went across a wooden bridge, you know, the wooden, like we don't have anywhere. And they got on this bridge, and the bridge just started to bounce and bounce and bounce. And, and the mouse goes, man, we make this bridge bounce. <laughs> That's us with the Lord. He is able to keep us and to cause great things to happen. Again, America, America, God, men, thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in the law. If this nation is going to be restored, it's going to take the Lord God to mend it. Right. And we Christians in the meantime are in a safe, wonderful place. Amen? Amen. The angel of the Lord encamps around us. So finally, the proper source of good. Have you ever been encouraged to taste a good food that you've never tasted before? Maybe you go over someone's house and they have something there for you to try. And listen, we have no choice. As a good Christian, as a pastor, I can tell you, I eat everything that's put in front of me, even though I might not want to. But there's this time where, you know, there's things you've never tasted, and you don't know if it's good until you give it a little taste. And I just, as a little guy, I was probably 10, 9 or 10, and I was a sturdy fella, husky, and my buddies and I took a ride to McDonald's. And I was the plainest guy ever. We'd go to McDonald's, and it was, I'd like a hamburger, plain, just ketchup. That was it. That's all I ever went for. Everywhere I was, it was plain, plain, plain. 
So we went to McDonald's and we rode our bikes. It was a long ride. We rode our bikes all the way home. And in my bag was a Big Mac. A Big Mac is as far from plain as you're going to get. But I had to keep my 32 size pants when I was 10 up. Okay? So I ate that Big Mac. And it revolutionized my life. <laughs> it really did. I now eat everything. Ask Michelle. I mean, not just what you're looking at, but onions and peppers. And in my life, all of a sudden, my palate has all this deliciousness to enjoy because I had a Big Mac. David uses this very analogy to us to trust in God alone. Look at verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. You know what I think some of the problem is? We've just tried God out. We've just maybe taken a little taste. And go, you know what? It's not quite to my liking. Maybe you're not just sure you want to indulge completely in him. Maybe you can only take God in small doses. I can tell you this is no way to live. This is a real problem. We ought to be those who are all in with God. That we are those that are not only tasting, but we are... Indulging in all feasting. That's the word. I can only think of bad words. <laughs> I can only think of bad words. Gluttony and all that sort of stuff. We ought to be those that are feasting on God. Yeah. That we are filled with his Holy Spirit. That's we right. can't get enough of his word. That we stay up nights reading it so that we might know more about our God. Taste and see that our Lord God is good. Blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied, envied is the man who trusts and takes his refuge in him. He will not put up with half in, half out. You must be all in, because if you're not, you're going to be all out. He said that in Revelation. Because you're neither hot nor cold, I have to spew you from, from my mouth. We want to see real change in our families, in this church, in this nation. We need to be those who are completely feasting in God. And let, thank you, John. Michelle, you have that. We have got to feast on God. So often, we're out at fast food places getting stuff that are not going to fill us up. Listen, Big Macs are probably not that great for you. You need a good, balanced diet. And God is that diet. He ought to be our diet. Verse 9, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. Those who taste will see that they are never thirsty, that they are never hungry. Our deepest respect and fear must be of God and God alone. In these days that we live, we must be those that are uncompromisingly committed to God. We must fear and respect God alone and not man. We are his holy ones, saints made righteous by Christ. So let's act like it. So often folks go, oh, I'm a Christian, but they don't act like it. Let's forget about, and take all the guesswork out. Let's know that we know that we know. You know how? We're going to feast on God day in and day out. James Montgomery Boyce says, our problem is not that we think of him too literally, but that we do not think of him literally enough. Right. In closing, if you turn with me to John chapter 6, verse 51 to 56. This idea of tasting the Lord, of imbibe, imbibing him, is something that Jesus really lays quite starkly forward, and it's really something that's been a real confusion <laughs> concerning Holy Communion, this idea of transubstantiation where they think they're eating the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in communion, it's not literally the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But by faith, it might as well be. Okay? 
John 6, 51 to 56. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. He says, I am the living bread. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The Jews, therefore, verse 52, quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, verse 53, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. By faith, we must eat and drink of the Lord Jesus Christ. He promises we will never be thirsty. We will never, ever be hungry. But the focus of our faith has got to be the Lord Jesus Christ. So just in closing, because you already turned pumpkins every one of you, I just want to summarize and say that, you know what? In this post-election time that we live in, we can be those who have great hope. That we can live, despite the, the, the lingering darkness and trouble, that God is in control. That he's watching over us. He's caring for us. That we can be those that are completely and totally taken in by the Lord God. I could have the musicians come forward. Just one more stanza from that beautiful song. Oh, beautiful for heroes prove in liberating strife, who more than self their country love, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine to all its success in nobleness and every gain divine. That's the picture of America that we want. An America that is completely self-consciously centered upon love for the Lord God. A Christian, that this truly might be a Christian nation. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? I believe David gives us a beautiful picture of what we ought to be shooting for. David in that dark cave lays out the good life, filled with radiant light, refulgent from the right hand of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives in us, with us, and will always be with us. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for the mercies that you've shown to us this past Tuesday. Father God, we pray that we might not be captivated with, with things that are passing, that are temporal, but that we might appreciate the passing temporal because it's a gift from Almighty God. May our country once again be a country that bows the knee more than it ever has to the Lord Jesus Christ. May Jesus be Lord in our individual lives, in our families, in our co communities, in the arts, in our works, our vocation. May he be Lord of this civil government once again. I pray for President Trump, Lord. He seems to have uh, a softness towards you, Father, and I don't think he knows you at this point. I pray, Father, you bring him to full repentance and recognition of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the plans that he has to, to sweep away some of the incredible darkness and unrighteousness in our nation. I pray that you might continue to surround him with uh, able uh, cabinet members, those, Lord God. I, I pray for those who love you with all of their heart to be around him, those who will point him to the word of God, that he doesn't have to wonder what is good legislation,
but he can look to the Bible. He can look to the Ten Commandments. Father, in these times, I pray you protect him. Uh, and, and Lord, we just pray for your mercy to be upon us. I would commend all of us as I close. O taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man who trusts in him. Amen.